All right. Uh, thank you. So I, I want to start by thanking the organizers. And you know, one always says that it's such an honor to speak at this conference. Um, but, but this, to me, really is a huge honor uh, to speak at Joe's birthday uh, conference. And it's something I deeply appreciate. Um, and uh, it'd be too difficult to go through the list of his, his many achieve, achievements, which I admire. Uh, let me echo Juan a little bit and, and emphasize that part of what made Joe such a huge inspiration to me is not just what he does, but how he thinks. Uh, there's, there's a purity to his thinking. When, when an argument has gone through the Joe, uh, then, then it comes out on the other end reduced to the bare basic monolithic structure of why A and B imply C, with everything unnecessary stripped away. Uh, and, and, and not too much stripped away either. It ends up being a very powerful and robust argument. Um, and, and you finally understand why fiddling with D, E, and F will not change the conclusion, because it's not part of the argument. And the firewall argument, I think, is a wonderful example uh, where you know, the initial reaction, including my own, was to try to fiddle with D, E, and F, um, but, but unfortunately, they're not. They're not relevant. It's, it's like a Bach fugue. There's not too much. There's not too little. It's just an intellectual joy to behold. Um, all right, with that out of the way, I'll remind you that he did invent the landscape. Uh, so um, all right, so I want to talk about the connection between uh, geometry and information. Um, we understand this connection best in the context of anti de Sitter space. Um, but there does appear to be a more general relation, at least at a conjectural level, uh, that holds in arbitrary space-times. And we would like to understand quantum gravity in arbitrary space-times, including cosmology. So it's probably worth trying to understand uh, where that relation comes from, and if it's actually true, and if we can make it precise. Um, uh, it's it's the, uh, a, bound, a conjecture called the covariant entropy bound, and it states that the entropy um, on the light sheet is uh, bounded by the difference between its initial and final area. And I'll go through that in some detail, because many of you will not uh, remember this or ever heard of it. Um, and what I want to do in this talk is present a proof of this relation uh, in quite a limited regime. I need to emphasize this. Uh, but I'll try to explain why I think the proof is nevertheless interesting and shed some light on, on uh, how we should think of this bound, at least in certain situations. Um, so let me review. The bound, um, this line here is supposed to represent a co-dimension two spatial surface. So in our world, it would be a two-dimensional spatial surface at an instant of time. Um, it doesn't have to be a planar. Uh, I'm suppressing, suppressing one spatial direction, obviously. Um, and it doesn't have to be closed either. Uh, but given a piece of such a surface, there are four orthogonal light-like directions away from it. Obviously, there wouldn't be a unique spatial orthogonal direction. Uh, for that, this thing is, is, is in a space-time. This has one uh, too many co-dimensions. Uh, but, but the null orthogonal structure is much more rigid. Uh, so, so you have a future-directed outgoing bunch of light rays orthogonal to this black line, future-directed ingoing, past-directed ingoing, past-directed outgoing. And if you follow those light rays, uh, they generate a, a null hypersurface, a 2 plus 1 dimensional hypersurface. Uh, one of whose uh, tangent directions is null, and the other ones are spatial. Um, you can also think of it as transporting this initial surface along the light rays. OK, so uh, those null hypersurfaces are not necessarily light sheets. Uh, to be a light sheet, they have to satisfy an additional condition. An, a null hypersurface is a light sheet if the generating light rays uh, are non-expanding. In other words, if the area is getting smaller as you move away from the initial surface and not larger. Um, and there's, there's a mathematical statement that corresponds to that. There's the expansion, um, which, which has to be non-positive. Uh, and you can think of the expansion as the logarithmic de uh, derivative of a infinitesimal area element that you're transporting along the geodesic. So it's completely locally defined. Uh, both locally in the transverse directions, but then also you can define an expansion at this point, and at this point, at this point along the light ray. Um, 
And really, the condition for a null hypersurface to be a light sheet is that uh, this non-expansion condition should hold everywhere on the light sheet. So this also tells you where you have to stop following the light rays. Namely, for example, if uh, neighboring light rays intersect, uh, they go through what I'll call a caustic. Um, then, of course, afterwards, they're going to start moving ap apart from each other, and this condition would be violated. So you can't go any further than that. Uh, another reason why you might have to stop is if light rays start coming together, but then without going through a uh, caustic, start moving apart again, though this can only happen if the null energy condition is violated. Um, so here's a very simple example. This would represent a two-sphere at some instant of time in Minkowski space, let's say. Again, there are four orthogonal null directions, and in this case, the light sheet directions are the ingoing ones. It kind of gives you the, uh, it gives you a generalized notion of what you mean by the inside of some surface, even if the surface is not closed, and even if you're in a curved geometry. And the covariant entropy bound is the following statement. So pick any space time with reasonable matter content, and we'll have to hope that we can understand better what that means. Uh, choose an arbitrary two-dimensional surface um, of area A. Uh, pick one of the pos possibly multiple different light sheets that that surface has away from it. Um, and, then, and then the claim is that the entropy of the matter that's captured on this light sheet uh, is less than the area that you started with in Planck units. OK, and before I go into the subtleties of how to define this entropy and why we're confused about that, um, let me just try to, by, the, by way of motivation, explain why it is important to uh, work with null hypersurfaces if you want to relate uh, information to geometry uh, in a general space time. Why it clearly does not work to work with spatial uh, volumes instead. OK, so, so there are. Uh, independently of any subtleties about how to define the entropy, uh, there are just violent counterexamples to my straw man, the space-like entropy bound. Um, for example, consider a closed universe. This is supposed to be a three-sphere at an instant of time. Uh, we have here a huge volume, which is bounded by a tiny two-sphere near the North Pole. Uh, and so you know, this could be radiation sitting here. Arbitrarily large entropy, arbitrarily small area. Um, I clearly have a violation here in the limit where I make that two-sphere small. Um, and, and you know what's wrong, right? It's, it's, it's crazy to think that this tiny two-sphere could have something to do with the arbitrarily large three-sphere that it might, or nearly complete three-sphere that it might bound. Um, we want some rule that knows that we should be going towards the North Pole. And, and indeed, the light sheet rule knows that. So in a space-time diagram, this would be the sphere and the future or past directed light rays towards the North, North Pole form a light sheet. And they don't have a lot of entropy on them. You can check that the bound is OK. Um, here's another example in a flat expanding universe. Uh, flat, OK, so it's Euclidean spatial geometry. So we know that the entropy is some entropy density times r cubed uh, for a large sphere. Uh, the area goes like r squared. Uh, and so I can make the ratio arbitrarily large and violate a space-like entropy bound. but um, the covariant bound's OK because uh, you're forced to go to very large spheres to go to this limit. And those very large spheres um, are what are called uh, anti-trapped. That means that the universe is, on these scales is expanding so rapidly that the contracting null directions are the past directed ones, no matter which side of the surface you're going to. So even if you want to go to the outside of the sphere, you have to go towards the past to satisfy the light sheet condition. And then those light sheets are truncated. Here are two of them. Uh, by the singularity. So as you move the sphere out, in fact, the entropy that they pick up is only a sort of shell whose, whose volume scales like the area. Um, and, and then again, in detail, if you check it, it works out. Uh, and then this is kind of the time reverse. If you have a collapsing star at very late times when it's already way inside the black hole that it's formed, but still in a semi-classical regime, the area of the surface of the star can be very small. The entropy of the star couldn't have decreased. So spatially, you have a problem. But the light sheets have to go towards the future because surfaces inside the black hole are trapped. And they do not see, they do not sort of penetrate all the way to the center of the star. They don't see all of that entropy. So they're clever enough to avoid, um, to avoid running into trouble. One more thing uh, before I get to the um, 
current part of the, of the talk, uh, is a generalization, which is going to be important because that's uh, the thing that, that uh, we'll actually be proving. Um, I told you that you have to stop when the area begins to increase. Uh, but of course, you could voluntarily stop earlier than that um, at some area A prime uh, without making use of your freedom to, to consider a larger null hypersurface. Um, and it is natural, for reasons I won't go into, to conjecture that in this case, uh, you can strengthen the right-hand side of the bound. Um, in some sense, I've, I've, I've needlessly thrown away some entropy I could have had here on the left-hand side, the part that was in this region. Uh, but in exchange, well, I now have a non-zero final area. And why don't I just subtract that from the initial area? It's going to give me something positive by the non-expansion condition. Uh, and and let's, let's conjecture that that's the bound we're after. Um, OK. Now uh, it's time to complain. Um, the the right-hand side in the semi-classical gravity regime, yes, Veronica? You could, you could, you could, yeah, you could, you could. Uh, that's fine, though. That's fine, though. And, and uh, no such settings are known to lead to violations of the bound. And it's not particularly surprising because the bound had better hold if I remove part of the initial surface so that I no longer have non-local intersections. It, it has to hold on each part of the light sheet separately. So then you just, yeah. So then, in, in what, what Veronica is asking about is that there are also non-local intersections. So if I have two parallel planes and I look at their light sheets. Then there are light rays that are intersecting with each other, um, uh, which come from opposite ends. Uh, and I don't have to stop there. Um, and, and, and as far as I know, that, that never leads to. So that's when the, when the light sheets leave the boundary of the future of the initial surface. But that doesn't seem to be. So yeah, we, we, can, we can stay with the strong version of the bound. Um, yeah, so, so one thing that's. Um, Troublesome here is so that the right-hand side is pretty sharply defined, at least in the semi-classical regime, where I know what my geometry is. The left-hand side, the entropy is not. Um, one reason is that you never really, right, I'm talking about the entropy in some spatial volume or pretty much equivalently. I mean, I want to stress that there's nothing that mysterious about being on a light sheet. So here's a star. This is the world line of a star. Uh, here's how it registers at some instant of time. Here's how it registers on some null hypersurface. It's just an instant of time, a limit of an instant of time. So that's not the problem. The problem is that you never really know whether um, a, an object quantum mechanically is localized to some spatial region or to some portion of, of some null hypersurface. Even a hydrogen atom has a wave function that has an exponential tail that goes out to infinity. Now, you know, Usually, we don't have to worry about this too much. But in principle, it's something that should uh, you know, be clarified. So under what conditions can we say that a system is actually on the light sheet? Why can we neglect those tails? And conversely, there are some contributions we don't like, which I've tacitly ignored. If I take the vacuum even, or any quantum state with finite energy, and I restrict to some finite region, I actually pick up an, an infinite entanglement entropy. It diverges like the boundary area divided by some cutoff squared. Uh, why am I not including that? And you know, in cosmology, in the settings that, that, that originally motivated this bound, we don't usually have to worry about these subtleties. We know what we mean by the entropy of the star. We don't worry about the star having some exponential tail in its wave function. Um, but, but interestingly, the generalized covariant bound, the one where you get to subtract the final area, um, can be non-trivial in the regime where gravity is weak. So the, the, the original covariant bound, to saturate that, you had to have very strong gravity, black holes, um, highly dynamical collapsing regions or expanding regions, there you can get close to saturating the bound. Um, and then the entropy is always very large, and you don't worry about the subtleties in the definition of the entropy. But in the generalized covariant bound, um, you can get close to saturating this bound even in the perturbative regime where gravity is very, very weak. And a nice example is if you consider a single wave packet, a photon or something, 
uh, and apply the, covariant bound, the generalized covariant bound to it. Now, the toughest way I can apply it is to start with a planar surface and emit imaginary x-rays uh, orthogonal to it. So the expansion is initially zero. I'm almost violating the non-expansion condition. And then the little wave packet is going to focus those light rays a tiny little bit, like the sun focuses light rays. Um, and then you ask, OK, so how big is the cross-sectional area after they're done doing that on the other side of the wave packet? And it's one Planck length squared, order one Planck length squared less than we started with. Um, so the right-hand side of the bound, delta A, is of order one. The left-hand side of the bound, the number of possible states, log of that, order one. Um, and so now you'd really like to know, well, exactly what is the entropy? You can compute the area quite precisely, but the entropy is really order one. And, and uh, you know, we're, we're close to maybe even violating this bound. Okay. Uh, so the nice thing is, uh, and this is something that actually happened a long time ago, but I was fast asleep, um, is that, that uh, in this limit where gravity is weak, which we can think of as a G Newton goes to zero limit, but we can also think of it as a H bar goes to zero limit where we sort of hold the Compton wavelengths of, of, of all objects fixed. Um, uh, it becomes possible to define the entropy in a much better and sharper way. Okay. Um, so this builds on, 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 on work by Merrill, Minich, and Ross, and by Cassini, maybe others that uh, I should be mentioning. Um, and for brevity, because these people are so many, I'm going to call it Cassini entropy. Sorry, Don. And, uh, um, and George. Uh, so, yeah, so uh, let's consider two... Um, states in Minkowski space. These are global quantum states. One of them is going to be the vacuum. The other one I'm just going to call rho global. It could be pure or mixed. I don't care. And, um, and let's just forget about gravity altogether for a moment. So, so it's just quantum field theory in Minkowski space. Uh, and so there's a fixed geometry. When I restrict to a subregion V, I can do this uh, both for, I mean, I can do this for both states. If I include gravity and, and, and rho global is some strongly gravitating thing like a neutron star, this just doesn't make any sense at step one. <laughs> right? I have a completely different geometry. What would it mean to restrict to the same subregion? So this is where this perturbative assumption enters uh, in a substantial way. Um, and I can then trace over the complement of this region, um, and I can again obtain two states uh, or density operators, rho and rho zero. Is this? Clear. So then um, both of these actually have divergent von Neumann entropy because of this entanglement entropy across the boundary of, of the surface uh, of, the, of the subregion V. Uh, but the difference is finite. And this difference, which I'm going to call Cassini entropy, delta S, it's, it's, so it's a difference of two von Neumann entropies that of the actual state I care about restricted to the region V and of the vacuum restricted to the region V. It has nice properties. Uh, first of all, it gives us back our intuitive, sensible, everyday notion of entropy for systems like this star, which are well localized to some region V and which are, you know, uh, where we don't usually get confused about the entropy. Um, it does reproduce the global entropy that you would compute as the von Neumann entropy of rho global. Um, but it gets rid of some annoying problems that always uh, pestered uh, discussions of, of, of entropy bounds, especially in the weak gravity limit. Uh, many of you will have heard of the species problem. Uh, the the, the, the right-hand side of the bound, the area loss, only cares about the stress tensor, right? What's, what's changing the area spanned by these light rays is focusing due to the presence of energy. Um, but, but the left-hand side, the amount of entropy, naively it seems that we can make that arbitrarily large by considering an, an incoherent superposition of wave packets of different species. So it's always the same stress energy, but I have you know, 10 gazillion different kinds of photon. Um, the entropy in that case is log n, where n is the number of species. By making that large enough, it seems I can violate the bound. Um, but there you find that in that limit, uh, the Cassini entropy and the global entropy uh, will diverge from each other. The global entropy has this log n divergence, um, and the Cassini entropy levels off. And this is, in fact, um, physically quite appropriate, uh, as was discussed by Minich, Merov, and, and, and Ross, and by, by Cassini, um, 
it really captures, so for example, we could consider that uh, the, the, the entropy, um, we could consider this region to be uh, the Rindler, one of the Rindler wedges. Um, and in, in such a Rindler wedge, an observer restricted to this wedge, an accelerated observer, uh, sees a temperature, and that temperature prevents you from actually being able to discriminate between too many different species, because if you crank up n too much, those things appear unsuppressed in the thermal radiation. They're just floating around you. And so there's a real physical sense in which uh, that information is useful. I mean, if, if, you know, if you actually have a, if you encode information in the choice of species, that is useful information that can be read out by a global observer, but not by an accelerated observer. So it's really quite, um, quite physical. This is not just some mathematical gimmick. Um, so with that out of the way, so this is the entropy that I'm going to prove something about. Okay, so now the question is, how can we prove that this is less than or equal to some area difference? Um, and this should be proof, not proofs. Um, so, uh, so I'm only going to be able to do this again in, in, in this weak gravity limit, uh, and in fact, uh, only for free fields, and there might be additional subtleties that I'm glossing over. Um, but, but I think there's some structure there which has some significance. So um, this is work jointly with, uh, with Cassini, with my student, uh, Zach Fisher, and with Juan Malacena. And uh, it kind of piggybacks on earlier work by Cassini and by, by Aaron Wall. Um, so so uh, again, it's a quite a, it looks like quite a limited regime, but, but I think uh, here are two reasons why I think there's some structure that's interesting. One is that it's nice to see that we can complete such a proof without starting with some explicit assumption that connects entropy and energy density. Oh, you know, to have this much information stored, you always need at least this much energy. There's no such, such explicit assumption involved, uh, nor are there any classical uh, energy conditions invoked. In fact, the most interesting part of the proof uh, is how it relies sensitively on enforcing the non-expansion condition uh, in situations where the null energy condition is violated. Yes? Um, well, I, I, I think what's happening is that in such a world there would, you, you wouldn't have a stable vacuum on null hypersurfaces. So there's One thing that eventually comes in is that there's a lot of what happens here relies on the existence of this reference state, the vacuum. Uh, and you have to define this reference state on the null hypersurface. And the definition of that reference state, uh, well, de demanding that this vacuum be bound, that its energy be bounded from below is essentially the average null energy condition. It's interesting that we don't seem to need more than that. Uh, th that's why I'm, yeah. I find this somewhat baffling. Um, so, so we need two more ingredients. Uh, so we have the Cassini entropy. We need two more things, the relative entropy uh, and the modular Hamiltonian, uh, whose expectation value is called the modular energy. I'll just introduce them now. Um, this is some information theoretic thing that's been around for a long time. Um, the relative entropy, it's not the difference of two von Neumann entropies. It's not the Cassini entropy. It's an asymmetric thing, if you see here. Uh, we're subtracting the von Neumann entropy of rho, uh, but then we have a minus trace rho log rho naught. So this is, this is, this is not symmetric under exchange of rho and rho naught. Uh, what it is, is uh, it's positive and it's monotonic, uh, which means that uh, if I restrict rho and rho naught further to some perhaps even smaller region, more generally to a subalgebra, um, the relative entropy um, is non-increasing. Yeah, it goes down, and it, it then eventually goes down to zero as you basically eliminate the entire algebra. Um, and conversely, if you consider larger and larger regions, it'll be monotonically non-decreasing. Um, and then uh, finally, uh, the, the modular Hamiltonian, um, it's, it's, the, rho naught doesn't really have to be a vacuum state, but that's what we'll, we'll think of it as being in, in our case. Um, and it just has to be what's called a faithful state, which is that it means that it's a density matrix where you, know, you don't have any zero entries in it. 
then you can take its log, and that's basically what, 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 what the modular Hamiltonian is. It's the log of a density matrix, uh, in this case of the vacuum density matrix. Um, and and, and you, you can compute its expectation value um, in some state rho. Uh, and just like for the Cassini entropy, we're going we're gonna to regulate that by subtracting off uh, the vacuum expectation value. Okay, so um, it's, it's a matter of two lines of algebra uh, to show that the positivity of the relative entropy is exactly the same statement as Cassini entropy is less than or equal to, to the expectation value of the modular Hamiltonian. Okay, this you can find in Cassini's 2008 paper, for example. Um, and, and this is not exactly what we're after. We're after some, some delta A here on the, on the right-hand side. But it's a good starting point because we can relate uh, the modular Hamiltonian expectation value to the area increase of a causal horizon. That's what Aaron Wall did. Uh, or what we will do is to relate it to the uh, area difference of, of sort of the toughest possible light sheet you could choose to, uh, to, to, to uh, x-ray a region. And this is, uh, uh, well, so it's, it's useful to start with what Wall did um, and, then, and, then, and then generalize from there. Uh, so what Wall was interested in is, is proving the generalized second law uh, for, for Rindler space. Uh, I'm going to give a, 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 a dumbed down caricature and you'll, what he does is much more careful and, and, and a bit more general. Uh, but, but the modular Hamiltonian on the Rindler horizon has been known for quite some time. Um, and it's, it's given by this expression. It's basically the, well, the integral over the transverse directions and then an integral along the null direction. Um, of the stress tensor, the, the plus plus component, so contracted with the, with the uh, uh, tangent vector, uh, times the distance from the bifurcation surface. So uh, x plus uh, appears in here. Okay. Um, and that's the modular Hamiltonian. We want to relate this to some area difference. The area difference that we're interested in in this case is, well, you know, this horizon goes all the way out to infinity. Up here, by definition, since it's a causal horizon, has zero expansion. And what we're interested in is running this back to this bifurcation surface, how much does the area change? The, infinite, the, the, the cross-sectional area is infinite, but the change is actually finite, so we don't have to worry about regulating this. Um, and, and we can compute it. What we do is we take the Ray-Chaudhuri equation. So this is the, sort of the, the way that, that, that we're operating at leading order in G Newton. Right? We're treating this as a flat background. But then, including the gravitational back reaction by integrating up the Ray-Chaudhuri equation, it tells us, uh, integrating it once tells us the, the expansion as a function. We're integrating down from infinity. We get the expansion as a function of, uh, of the, the position along the light rays. Uh, and then we do this for each light ray, of course. I'm suppressing the transverse directions in this expression. Um, and then we integrate it a second time. Remember, the, the, uh, the expansion is the logarithmic derivative of the area. So uh, so then, uh, again, we expand this to first order, and we find that the area difference is essentially exactly the same thing as the modular Hamiltonian. You see these red parts are the same. The only difference is the 8 pi g versus the 2 pi over h bar. And so, um, so we, we, we get what we want. In this case, there's an equality. The modular Hamiltonian is equal to the uh, area difference uh, divided by 4 L Planck squared. Um, and, and, and in the case that we'll consider, there will be another inequality, which is good enough. Um, OK, so again, this is, this is leading order in G. And, and notice there's a cancellation, right? So what's happening is that delta A uh, goes linearly with G Newton. And so the G Newtons cancel out in the result. So you can really take the, make, make, make the back reaction arbitrarily small. Um, so, so uh, Aaron uh, proved a more general result uh, where, you know, instead of the process that, that I just implicitly considered, where you look at all of the entropy that passes through the uh, Rindler horizon all at once, um, you consider different slices, and you consider this Rindler wedge, and then that Rindler wedge, and then that Rindler wedge. And what you want to see is that the area of the new bifurcation surface plus whatever entropy is left is bigger than the area of the old bifurcation surface plus whatever entropy you then had. Um, and and uh, you, can, 
You can use monotonicity, which is the stronger statement about, strong, uh, about um, the relative entropy rather than positivity to get that. Further, uh, Aaron uh, still wasn't happy, uh, and he, he wanted to consider arbitrary slices, not just planar slices of the Rindler horizon. He wanted to consider non-Rindler causal horizons. Um, and in order to do that, he, he posited and argued that it holds uh, a number of axioms about the operator algebra on the null hypersurface. Um, the key one that we're going to need here is ultralocality that uh, has been reasonably justified for free fields, and, and we'll, we'll have to see how much further we can go beyond uh, free fields. It means that the algebra factorizes. So if you, if you break up your null hypersurface into different generators or pencils of generators, um, the, the operator algebra is just a product of algebras that live on these individual uh, light rays or, or broadened light rays. They, they don't talk to each other. Um, and, and then you can see how that allows you to basically treat infinitesimal cross-sections of the, of the light sheet separately, and you no longer have to worry about the overall shape of the transverse direction. Um, what we wanted to do is, um, yeah, uh, is to apply this to um, a finite light sheet. And um, at first, this looks pretty hopeless. The reason it looks hopeless is that you know the Rindler modular Hamiltonian looks very nice, but as soon as you instead of considering the whole Rindler uh, wedge, if if you look at only a finite volume, the modular Hamiltonian is a god awful non-local mess. Uh, it's not the integral of some function times the stress tensor. It's something totally horrible. It's the log of some density operator. It's not surprising that it should be horrible. Um, nevertheless, one finds that on null hypersurfaces. Uh, it appears to have special properties and simplify dramatically. We can use ultralocality to first break this up into individual generators and then use a conformal symmetry uh, that, that emerges on each generator, which was noted by Wall, though he didn't need it for anything, um, to take the Rindler modular Hamiltonian, which, after all, we can think of as corresponding to the interval 1 to infinity, uh, and by inversion, uh, create, you know, compute the modular Hamiltonian on the finite interval 0 to 1. Um, and, and here's what you find. It's, it's a very simple calculation. Uh, and it kind of looks like the Rindler Hamiltonian, except the integral is only from 0 to 1. And there's an extra factor. In addition to this x plus, there's a 1 minus x plus appearing. It had better be symmetric so that, I mean, under reflection, so that, that, that makes sense. Um, and now, it, at first, you look at this and you say, OK, this is great, because the area difference is just going to be the same thing without the 1 minus x plus. And so we're done. Uh, we again, this time we'll have an inequality, but 1 minus x plus is positive, so we're, we're doing great. Um, but of course, it's not. It doesn't work. Uh, it doesn't work because the stress tensor doesn't have to be positive. Um, and, and so that's, that's just too bad. In fact, you can find explicit ex counterexamples where the modular Hamiltonian is, in fact, not less than the area difference. Um, however, I have implicitly kept um, a, a sort of uh, an inheritance from this causal horizon analysis, which was appropriate for causal horizons, but no longer is appropriate now. I was assuming that the initial expansion can be taken to vanish. We're trying to, to test the bound in the toughest possible way, so we don't want to have the light rays already start, you know, contracting and coming out of the initial surface. Then, then you know, we could we could obtain a tighter bound by uh, having them be non-expanding, uh, but but also non-contracting. So that would be the the generic choice. But we're getting trouble because the null energy condition might be violated in the same setting where the null energy condition might be violated. Um, it may no longer be OK to choose initial expansion equal to 0. Why? Because you might run into negative energy. And before you even make it from 0 to 1 along the null direction, you already have to terminate your light sheet because you got to, be positive, you got to positive expansion. You have to stop that from happening. Okay, so so in, that, in those settings, um, we may have to choose uh, theta 0 to be strictly negative initially. Um, which we can by slight deformations of the initial surface, which will only lead to other higher order corrections in GH bar. Okay. Um, so 
what we're doing by choosing slightly negative expansion initially is basically making sure that the expansion somewhere between 0 and 1 never becomes positive. Right? We're compensating for the anti-focusing that the negative energy is, is causing, and making sure that it, we're just sort of scraping disaster, but not ending up anywhere with positive expansion between 0 and 1. And so we basically want to just find the, the, the tightest bound on, 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 on theta 0 that allows us to satisfy this equation for all values of x plus. Okay. And so now there's a new piece in the formula for the area loss. It's basically the initial expansion times the length of the interval, which we're choosing for convenience to be 1. So it's just, it's just the initial expansion. If the initial expansion is negative, then this contributes an additional positive contribution to the area loss. Um, and that's enough to restore the inequality that we're after, uh, it turns out. So what we want to do is now use the non-expansion condition to eliminate theta naught. Um, it's essentially an integration by part, or you can, you can think of it as choosing some positive function, f, little f that integrates to 1. So capital F is the integral of little f. Um, and, and then using the positivity of theta everywhere between 0 and 1, uh, you obtain this inequality for the initial expansion. Uh, you stick it in here, and now you get delta A is greater than something. And what is greater than, with a particular choice where f is 2 minus 2x plus, um, is the modular Hamiltonian. So we have the result uh, that we were after, and then remember that we can continue this inequality just by positivity of the relative entropy. So now we're, we're happier. And uh, just uh, to close with some comments, again, I want to stress that it was absolutely crucial here to demand the non-expansion condition on the entire light sheet. It was never quite clear how important that is. Maybe the right way of thinking about this is you just demand it on the initial, uh, you know, when you emanate from the initial surface and then just hope for some average version of the null energy condition to hold. But no, this was very rigorously necessary to complete the proof. Um, and, well, I've, I've said the other things. We, we didn't seem to have to need, to, to need very explicit assumptions about energy versus entropy. Um, I want to say monotonicity um, can actually be shown. So the stronger statement that instead of considering just an interval from 0 to 1, we can let the interval get larger and larger. And then what you can show is that the uh, difference between the area loss and the entropy increases monotonically. So then, of course, it's also positive, which was the uh, result I proved. But in fact, it's also monotonic. Um, and and uh, this result would follow even if the modular Hamiltonian had a slightly different form. What it does have to be, it seems to us, is it has to be local. So it has to have this nice local form, an integral of a stress tensor. And the function that multiplies the stress tensor has to have the right values and derivatives at the corners to coincide with the Rindler limit. And it has to be concave in between. Um, and we, we tried understanding interacting theories. And interestingly, so we find one good thing. Um, uh, you can compute the modular Hamiltonian uh, using Ryutaka Yanagi for theories uh, that, that have a bulk dual, so some interacting conformal field theory. Um, uh, what you do is you compute the, the, the entropy using Ryutaka Yanagi, but then you, you, you consider states which are very close to the vacuum for which you're guaranteed that the entropy and the modular Hamiltonian are actually the same at linear order. And, and, uh, and this group of people here uh, has shown that that basically allows you to fully construct the modular Hamiltonian. And what we find is that, so we take a null limit of some, of some spatial uh, strip on the, on the boundary. Um, we find that, that the modular Hamiltonian takes a local form once again uh, and is, in fact, concave, though it's not the same function as the one. But it's, it's a function that allows you to complete the proof. Uh, yeah, yeah, so, so that's right. So it's, it's, it's a transverse integral, but also along the light ray, uh, it's, it's, a, it's an integral just of the stress tensor. There aren't arbitrarily high derivatives appearing. Um, yeah, 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 right. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that's interesting. That's very nice. Uh, unfortunately, we also seem to find that even far away from the vacuum, uh, the, the Cassini entropy and the modular Hamiltonian uh, seem to be equal to each other for all states. Uh, this we don't know how to make sense of yet, uh, and so I'm asking you to stay tuned. Um, okay, happy birthday, Joe.
Okay, we have time for a few short questions. Don. Uh, you can shout loud enough, Don. <laughs> Ah, good, good, good. Yeah. So, so uh, that's because it's not clear um, what we would mean by the same. So, th I think this goes for spatial regions just as well as as, as null hypersurfaces. Um, what we want to do is we want to start with two global states, and then restrict to the same spatial region. I don't. So, I, I don't know how to I don't know how to define the subtraction. Otherwise, do you, do you see a way of doing it without Well, it's a partial light sheet that runs. It's a partial light sheet that runs from one area to another, one cross-sectional area of the light sheet to another. In the vacuum and in an excited state, um, the cross-sectional areas that exist on the light sheet, that foliate the light sheet, will all be completely different from each other. And so it's not clear to me how to compare. I mean, where am I going to stop uh, in one case and in the other? How, how do I make sure that the length of the light sheet is the same in both cases? It, it's not a sphere that's converging. It's a finite. Um, it's a slab. In the, it's a slab. But it may, it, you know, it, I think that that you. The the initial expansion, as you may have uh, noticed, also has to be order g h bar. Okay, that's what I missed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the initial expansion has to be g h uh, order g h bar. Uh, so it was important that, that we can enforce the non-expansion condition by choosing it to be at that strength and no, no stronger. Yeah. So that would be a really exciting, you know, if, if there was some natural generalization to, to other light sheets, that would be fantastic. But um, that, that's where we are. Uh, some entanglement entropy? Well, yeah, 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 yeah. Well, yeah, yeah, but we're not allowed to call it relative entropy because that word's taken. Yeah. But I thought that you would construct simple states where you, the, this simple object would be, you couldn't put any idea in order, but would be. Yeah. That, that is the normal healthy situation. Right. What we're finding is that we can't get any corrections on null hypersurfaces that would ever allow, it, allow the two things to deviate from each other. Uh, and we're stumbling around trying to understand whether there's something. It, 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 I, th I think the result is almost certainly correct uh, for, for null hypersurfaces uh, that have no focusing and, 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 and there's in a theory with no gravity. The question is whether it's, um, it's an artifact of having chosen null hypersurfaces that sort of could not be inherited from a theory with gravity. In a theory with gravity, the initial and final surface are always different from each other. But we don't understand this question. 
Okay, I think it's time to move on. Let's thank Raphael again.